Okay, welcome back everybody. We are live again. Uh, this is Antonio Cianani speaking and uh, it's my pleasure to chair the final part of today's session. And uh, we have uh, now the first of three lectures by Daniel Segre from Boston University. And you can read the title by yourself from genome scale to ecosystem level modeling of metabolism. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Antonio. Um, welcome, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be talking to all of you. I'm talking from Boston, uh, where it's mid morning. Um, I'm going to start um, by showing you the agenda. So we're going to talk today mostly about the logic of the cell, uh, how to think about metabolism as a resource allocation problem. And we'll see next um, how to scale from genomes to ecosystems um, in looking at spatiotemporal modeling and the long-term history of metabolism. So my hope for today is really to um, convey the way I think it's interesting to think about metabolism and, and some, uh, you know, addressing some of these questions, hopefully motivating um, um, deeper uh, insight. And I'll, I'll keep this um, um, fairly um, broad, so to make sure that everybody's on the same page. And we'll address questions such as what is metabolism and why does it matter? Why should we be interested in studying metabolism? And why do we need mathematical models to understand it? And we'll see also, we'll start seeing why we can think of it as an ecosystem property. Um, and I'll start by sharing something that I always find stunning, which is uh, that microbes, despite being so small, uh, can really change the uh, destiny and fate of a planet. And in fact, they did. Uh, this is what you see here is uh, the line of the amount of oxygen present in the atmosphere on, on our planet uh, throughout uh, the history of uh, life from about 3.8 billion years ago until today. And one thing that is clear here is that early on, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere, barely any. And the reason oxygen started rising and becoming what it is today is due to the activity of bacteria such as this one, oxygenic cyanobacteria that photosynthesize and in doing so produce oxygen. And it is because of these microbes that we have oxygen today and, the, and it is because of these uh, microbes that uh, the planet changed completely allowing uh, the rise of multicellular complex systems, complex biological systems. So it's really important to understand how the metabolism of these organisms can affect at such a global scale, um, uh, other systems. Another reason to study metabolism, as of course all of you know, is that we are largely made of microbes. Uh, that is, um, many of the cells in our body are microbial cells. Uh, this is an estimate from uh, Ron Milo and colleagues showing that uh, there is a little bit more bacterial cells inside and around us than there are our own human cells. Uh, uh, so these are mostly in our gut, but there are microbes everywhere, and we're just starting to uh, understand what role they play and how they interact with our body and uh, with each other. And this also uh, happens largely through metabolism, as we'll see. And there are many other reasons to be interested in metabolism and by micro microbial metabolism in particular. Here are some examples. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this, but there is a lot of interest in trying to understand how microbes can help produce uh, biofuels and useful molecules from plant biomass, uh, how they can affect global biogeochemical bio cycles, whether they can help uh, plant and crop production. And there is a rising interest in how microbiomes in the built environment affect uh, uh, human life at different scales. Now, if you zoom inside and try to understand what is it that happens and that makes all of this uh, processes happen, uh, this is what it is. This is metabolism. Many of you have seen this chart hanging on the walls of biochemistry labs. Um, in metabolism, what is one of the things that is beautiful about it is that really spans all scales of biology from individual cells, again, to metabolism is happening uh, in the biosphere. Each line in this graph is a chemical reaction. We see, we'll see some examples soon. And this is a global biochemical chart that is the collection of all chemical reactions happening across all living systems. These are all now available on databases. Um, but it's, uh, you know, one of the questions, how do we uh, start understanding the history of this system and how it um, 
translates into all these processes that microbes are involved in. And I like to think of um, the hierarchy of biology in a way that maybe is a little bit unusual. We tend to think of uh, how you go from molecular reactions, this would be a simple uh, chemical reaction and how this builds complex networks uh, of, for example, the in, intracellular circuits in a cell. And this in turn leads to uh, cellular dynamics, growth and division and so on, and then scaling up to ecosystem uh, level processes. But what I hope uh, we'll appreciate is that actually the, this is uh, process can go back and forth. And in fact, a lot of the modeling we'll discuss will have to do with starting from uh, yeah, you know, determining the molecular structure, but also looking at the ecosystem dynamics, dynamics and cellular processes and trying to understand based on what we know at the higher level, uh, how those functions uh, constrain the way molecular reactions should work. So somehow we can navigate this hierarchy back and forth and not necessarily just building upward more and more complex uh, systems. By the way, I should say, uh, feel free to interrupt any time. I don't know if I'll be able to see in the chat but feel free to step in if you have any question or anything is, is unclear. I'm, I have an agenda for today, but uh, if we don't cover everything, it's, it's fine. And I'm rather uh, be happy for everyone to um, have these concepts clear. Um, so one of the questions we'll, we'll delve in between today and the next uh, two hours um, is whether and how we can predict ecological interactions. There is this green arrows based on intracellular circuits, that is what happens inside each cell. And how do we do that? Um, I will start by actually stepping back into something much simpler. Um, uh, what I like to think of as a, a sandbox for playing with toy metabolic networks. And, and this is, a, uh, I think, a really useful exercise to start thinking about what is metabolism all about um, in a much, much simplified way. But it also raises a lot of interesting questions, as you'll see. So this is. Um, was motivated by work um, um, we did a few years ago uh, with uh, Sid Redner, Paul Krapisk, and Bill Real, and, and it's inspired by other uh, work on these string chemistries. And this is a, a, a artificial chemistry, a toy chemistry that is very simple. Um, in this case, there are just monomers A that can be combined, uh, uh, for example, um, in this way, 1A plus 2A will be rise to 3A, as you can express it in this way. And in general, you have this, uh, uh, joining processes where um, a polymer of length i joins a polymer of, strength of length j to give rise to uh, the combined polymer. And you can uh, uh, write the diagram for the complete chemistry, for example, all the way to polymers up to length 4. And you can see that this is fairly simple. And if you ask at this level for this kind of chemistry questions such as what is the uh, most efficient way of producing A4 from A1, um, this is a pretty straightforward um, problem, which we can uh, solve uh, manually. Uh, and we want to have no waste of, of products and just use the minimal number of reactions. And the solution, of course, this this logarithmic growth uh, from two A1s, you produce A2, and from two A4, you produce, uh, from two A2s, you produce A4. Um, but this can get uh, uh, complex quite quickly. For example, if I show you the chemistry up to A7, um, and ask you how would you produce in an optimal way A7 from A4, this is something that would require a little bit of thinking. You may have to uh, break A4 into um, two A2s and, and so on and so forth, um, and gradually build up to A7. And I, I'm pointing you here, if anybody's interested in playing with this toy chemistry, you can create now, there is this tool we generated to uh, produce arbitrary steering chemistry with multiple monomers and different length, and you can play with this, uh, with this kind of scenarios. But I want to show you how uh, this connects back to our real metabolism. And in order to do so, I will start by showing how one can find these optimal pathways for going from any um, initial uh, molecule to any final molecule in, again, in this simplified chemistry. And just to give you an example, again, if you want to go from a molecule, again, of this string chemistry of length to one to a molecule of length six, uh, you can uh, make the two, the two ones, produce three, and so on. And, and this is easy. But there are uh, some interesting um, patterns that emerge. For example, for some of these processes, the optimal solution, such as going from a, uh, the seven to eight, includes having cycles like this, uh, where you need to 
have as an input a molecule that is generated by the process itself. So this is a little bit like an autocatalytic cycle where you need some of the internal pro, uh, molecules in order to bootstrap um, the activity of this cycle. And this is interestingly similar to a cycle that is present in real biochemical uh, networks. And this is the, representing the carbon backbone of the TCA cycle, which we'll see shortly. Uh, it's a fundamental biochemical pathway present in almost all living systems. And it has uh, this interesting property that is very similar. You have an input of a certain molecules. These are uh, molecules with two carbons, but it needs uh, the cyclic behavior in order to sustain itself. Uh, so this was interesting, but let's see, um, you know, if we go back to real metabolism, why this is so important and how do we translate this uh, analysis from our artificial chemistry to real chemistry. And of course, I don't have time and, you know, I'm covering here um, in a superficial way material that could take uh, whole courses, but I want to just give you an idea for those that uh, haven't looked at the chemistry uh, in recent times, what are the kind of molecules we think about and we'll take into account when looking at metabolism for microbes. This is methane. Um, and it turns out there are microbes that can survive on methane as the only carbon source and the only energy source, which is quite striking given the simplicity of this molecule. And this of course contains just carbon and hydrogen. But uh, the chemistry of life of course requires a lot more types of atoms. This is glucose that includes oxygen, um, um, a main source of carbon and energy for our, our own metabolism and many microbial cells. And you can um, add to it nitrogen, which of course is the essential an essential atom of all amino acids, such as tryptophan. Um, and I'm pointing this out because sometimes the chemistry is so complex that one gets easily lost, uh, like myself, but it's always useful to remember that just by looking even at what atoms are present in different molecules, there is a lot you can figure out what are the demands and, and the uh, needs of the cells in order to produce a certain category of molecules. So nitrogen is essential for the production of amino acids and proteins. Um, and there are molecules such as ATP that contain phosphorus. Uh, this is the three phosphate groups uh, that can be hydrolyzed to uh, release energy. And in fact, ATP, as uh, you probably know, is a fundamental molecule that stores energy. So this is the energy currency of the cell. And, um, and it's very important because that's how the cell um, transfers energy between processes and allows um, the, the driving of er reactions that would be otherwise um, thermodynamically um, infeasible. So um, the other atom that I want to point out is sulfur. It hasn't appeared yet. And it appears in this molecule, which is called coenzyme A. And you'll see, by the way, similarities. This uh, molecule is similar to ATP. Uh, and there is this chain that contains now a sulfur molecules. And here we really pretty much completed the main elements that are essential for living systems. There is, of course, more, there are metals and so on, but by and large, these are uh, some of the atoms one worries about when thinking about um, basic metabolism. And um, coenzyme A is a, is a cofactor that is used for transferring groups between reactions and is, again, a very widespread molecule across living systems. And I'll jump to a different scale to show you a different type of molecule. This is a protein of one a very large multi-protein enzyme complex called ATP synthase. Uh, this is a stunning machine. I'm always amazed when I see this. Uh, this is uh, a molecule that is made of many, many atoms, as you can see. And it's one of the enzymes that catalyzes, enables the reactions that transform the small molecules we saw before. In this case, this molecule is what um, enables the production of ATP across the membrane through a process called respiration, uh, which we'll see in a very uh, brief overview very soon. Uh, this is in the mammalian cells. But what is uh, amazing is that every single cell that contains these uh, molecules has to produce these proteins in enough amount to carry the reactions, and the reactions themselves are needed to fuel the production of these molecules in a very complex set of feedback loops. Notice, by the way, that proteins don't contain phosphorus. So again, interesting to look at the elemental composition of different classes of molecules. Uh, protein of the mass of our own cells, and they don't contain phosphorus. So one can start asking questions that we'll see later on um, of, of when and how different elements uh, uh, took part at different stages in the history of life uh, to uh, make it possible for living systems to jumpstart these metabolic processes. So 
I want to uh, now jump from this to starting to tell you how and why this metabolic processes really can affect ecology. We want to get uh, to ecology fairly quickly, although today we'll mostly talk about metabolism at the single organism level, but I want uh, to start getting some glimpse of why and how this is so important ecologically. So these are two basic um, um, metabolic pathways. And I'm drawing this again in this very simplified way that is the carbon back one. So these are the number of carbon molecules involved in this first molecule, which is actually glucose. It's broken down uh, ultimately into pyruvate, which is a three carbon molecule. And in this case, uh, there is another um, uh, cleavage leaving a carbon two molecule, which we'll see later is a fermentation byproduct. And in this process, the cells can produce two ATP. So there is a, the energy currency uh, production is two ATPs per glucose that is being broken down. And this is a fermentation process, what gives rise, for example, to ethanol in, in yeast and, and so on. Now, there is a different path when many cells can carry both processes. In fact, if you continue feeding some of these carbon two molecules in a number of different ways through the citric acid cycle, which is the cycle we saw before, this um, um, kind of semi-autocatalytic cycle uh, that, that we saw before, this process in a much more complicated way, which I'm not going to go into now, can lead to the production of 32 ATPs per um, glucose that is consumed. So this is a, an addition that makes a big difference in terms of the production of ATP. And um, again, many cells have the option of just stopping metabolism here, doing fermentation, or uh, keep going and, and uh, respire um, the molecules. Now, of course, things that much, are much more complex in real life, but this is just to give you an idea for those that are not familiar with metabolism, the kind of questions one can ask and, and what are the implications. So what are the implications for ecology and how one think about this? Um, so one thing that may be already obvious from this very different uh, yields is that in fact, there may be a rate yield trade-off that could be very important for competition and cooperation in, uh, across different bacteria. Uh, of course, this kind of metabolism is much more efficient. You produce so much more energy currency per glucose consumed, but there, are, um, there is evidence that this is somehow more cumbersome, potentially slower in terms of rate, um, and it certainly requires a lot more proteins in order to carry these processes. In fact, this uh, molecule, the ATP synthetase I showed you above, is exactly what allows the production of these 32 ATPs, and um, what is interesting is also, of course, this requires oxygen, as you might imagine, uh, respiratory pathways. This is the uh, done, um, final electron acceptor for this process. Um, uh, but what is important is that without oxygen or other electron acceptors, this metabolism cannot occur. Cells can run this metabolism in absence of oxygen. And it turns out what is quite interesting and still poorly understood, some cells uh, decide to use even in presence of oxygen, the ferment, fermentatory pathway. Um, and in fact, this is one of the hallmarks of cancer for those of you that are interested in mammalian metabolism. And there is also there questions about the ecology of uh, how different human cells interact with each other and tumor cells. But there is this known phenomenon uh, called the Warburg effect where human cells, even in presence of oxygen, will decide to ferment. Uh, there is a beautiful paper, if anybody is interested in reading more about this on this rate yield trade-off and possible consequences for the competition between fast um, but inefficient and slow but efficient organism. And this is this paper by Pfeiffer, Schuster, and Bonhoeffer. There is another uh, important possible impact, um, ecological impact of the uh, dichotomy between these different metabolic pathways. And this is the fact that, as we said, this molecule that is a carbon, six, six molecules could be glucose, uh, the C1 molecule that is secreted is CO2. And typically, the fermentation byproducts are organic acids. These are carbon two molecules, such as lactate, acetate, ethanol. Lactate is the fermentation byproduct produced by human cells, for example, and by cancer cells. Acetate is produced by E. coli. Ethanol is produced by yeast, as we all know. So what is interesting is that if cells choose use, to use this fermentative metabolism, they will secrete these byproducts. And these byproducts are perfectly usable carbon sources for other organisms. So you can imagine that uh, the decision of individual species to carry one metabolism versus another can have important consequences in terms of 
the capacity of interact with other organisms, um, enabling cross-feeding and exchange of molecules across different organisms. So keep that in mind and we'll get back to this later on. So the, the thing I told you a little bit about, right, in this previous slide is how metabolism are, um, is important for generating the energy currency, ATP, um, and also the redox equivalent, which we haven't talked about. But there is another key function that metabolism carries, which is not less important, in fact, very complicated, and it is the production of all the different monomers, the different molecules that are used for producing uh, proteins, the DNA, RNA, and all the components of the cell. So what you see here is a our, um, histogram of the proportion of the different biomass components in an E. coli cell. These are the different amino acids, the 20 amino acids, phospholipids, nucleotides. And this is, um, you know, if you were to take a snapshot of the dry mass of a cell and measure how much there is of each of these compounds, this is what you would get. This is in millimoles per gram of dry mass. So it turns out that the same pathway I just showed you, so you can recognize here the fermentation or glycolysis pathways going from glucose to pyruvate and then feeding into the TCA cycle. Um, so this same pathway, in addition to producing ATP, uh, can be um, piped along the way to produce other compounds, a lot of the amino acids and uh, precursors for uh, nucleotides and lipids are all coming along these different pathways. Um, so in the same pathway that produces energy needs also to carry the production of all these other molecules. And all of this has to be balanced in a very delicate way because of course you need to have the right amount of each of, of these molecules. It doesn't help if you're very good at producing glycine but cannot produce alanine. All of these are needed in the right proportions. And all of this has to be accomplished while at the same time, at the, same time the cell also produces the right amount of ATP because ATP is used for degrading um, molecules and building molecules. So it's all a very complex balance of uh, different reactions that have to uh, fit together in order to uh, efficiently produce all the biomass components. So you can see, start seeing the flavor of a resource allocation problem for the cell uh, and a problem that in fact is amenable to um, mathematical analysis. So we're gonna start talking now about genome scale uh, models, but actually let me, I don't know, I can pause here, just give an opportunity if there is any question so far. Okay, now I'll keep going. Okay, so we're gonna start introducing genome scale constraint-based models of metabolism. Um, and you'll find these models, uh, again, some of you may already know about these. Um, these are known in different ways. For example, they are known as genome scale models sometimes, constraint-based models or stoichiometric models, and they're all of the above. Uh, usually genome scale because one tries to model the whole metabolic network of a cell, constraint-based because as we'll see, uh, will rely strongly on constraints, uh, mostly related to mass conservation, stoichiometric because they are based on the stoichiometry of the different reactions in the cell. So um, one of the first problems in trying to make a genome scale model uh, of metabolism is to construct from this universal metabolism I showed before that contains again all the reactions known across, across all living systems. And now actually the numbers are larger. This is an outdated number. Um, there is probably more than 20,000 molecules uh, that are part of these databases now, but you need to filter this through the genome of an individual organism and ask, for example, which among all these different reactions is E. coli capable of doing? Um, and this is written in the genome. You have to read and see what reactions are present uh, and encoded by enzymes in the genome of this organism and translate this into a smaller network, which is the metabolic network that is specific for this organism. A typical bacterial organism has of the order of 1500 reactions and about the same number of metabolites. And this is what is called a metabolic network reconstruction. Is This is in itself now a whole process, partly because uh, we don't know uh, the function of all the genes. So when you, uh, when you try and read the DNA uh, of an organism, there is a lot of unknown uh, genes with unknown functions or partially known functions, uncertain functions. This is a very, very complex set of uh, steps 
Um, and they, they were, you know, it, it's really interesting that it involves uh, literature curation, sometimes manual curation. There is a lot of efforts uh, now to try and automate this process, but we're gonna uh, not go into the details of this and just assume that we have a genome scale network, the network of all the metabolic reaction occurring in a specific organism. And then we'll ask the next question of how to model this. So if you're um, interested in where to find these networks, these are some pointers. Bernard Paulson at UCSD has a list of curated uh, models on, and he's uh, one of the uh, first to bring this uh, field to uh, really uh, the systems biology field. Um, model Seed um, is a database of automatically reconstructed models from um, genomes. These are all present in the K-based, um, uh, also an open database from the Department of Energy that has a number of tools for reconstructing uh, models from genomes. And I want to just remind you, if you, um, you know, go into this, that you have to remember that there is a wide variability of completeness and accuracy of these models. Some uh, may have undergone ex uh, thorough experimental testing for many years and may be very, very well tested and uh, accurate. Others are just straight from the annotated genome and they may not be as accurate and complete, but it's all still always interest interesting to have something to start from and to build upon. So what is it that we're really talking about? How do you go now from this network and how do you represent the network and how do you translate this into a prediction of what an organism can and cannot do? Um, and I will start from illustrating what um, used to be or is still somehow the classical approach to addressing the question of what an organism can do, which is kinetic modeling. So again, if a typical prokaryotic cell may have about 1, 1,500 reactions and metabolites, this involves about 10,000 kinetic parameters. You could write differential equations describing the change of each metabolite in this network as a function of the rates of uh, the reaction that produce and consume that metabolite. And I, um, I assume many of you may be familiar with this. This is the michaelis menten equation telling, uh, telling us how the rate of the reaction depends on the amount of substrate present uh, in the uh, incoming molecule and this Vmax that is the maximal attainable uh, reaction rate, which depends on the amount of enzyme present for that reaction. And what is important here is that this is a nonlinear function of the substrate. So if you know the concentration of the substrate, you can calculate the flux, but there isn't a one-to-one -one, uh, linear relationship between the two. And at some point, if you keep adding substrate, the reaction um, will not keep growing in, in the rate because you might be limited by the enzyme. And the important thing is that you could write an equation like this for every single flux and every single rate in this network. And the real uh, reaction rates would look more like this than like this because they may have two incoming molecules and two outgoing molecules, multi-substrate, multi-product. So you really have a lot of different parameters and complex nonlinearities that make this kinetic modeling approach very complicated. But we're not gonna go into this and we're gonna abandon the kinetic modeling approach uh, for this much simplified uh, uh, version of metabolic modeling, uh, which is um, which is going to come next, and it's called flux balance analysis. But let me tell you first uh, briefly with this example, how do you represent a network? Um, again, this is an, an illustration of a simple network where you have metabolite A, for example, in a cell that is being imported through this reaction B1 and produced by a reaction, uh, sorry, consumed by a reaction B1, and then also consumed by V2, produced by V3 back from this metabolite C. So you could write for metabolite A this differential equation where um, there is a, each, a term for each reaction that consumes or produces that metabolite. And this is a, a linear relationship between these different fluxes. But remember that each of these fluxes has this dependence on the substrate, this lean, non nonlinear dependence uh, based on the michaelis minton reaction we showed above. So this is the same symbols, but it's actually a fairly complex differential equation. You can write such a differential equation for each metabolite, and you can easily represent this in the form of a matrix. So you'll have a vector of all the fluxes, a vector of all the metabolites and their uh, derivatives in time. And, and this matrix uh, really converts uh, the, the set of fluxes into the changes in metabolites this is what is called the stoichiometric matrix of uh, the network. And it's really a, a compact and very valuable representation of the structure of metabolism. So we're gonna, this stoichiometric matrix is essentially what you need to have 
as an outcome of the metabolic network reconstruction in order to start modeling uh, metabolism using flux balance analysis. Um, so as I said, um, this started um, as, as a um, you know, resource allocation problem. It started in the field of chemical engineering from Terry Papoutsakis and others and brought now to the forefront of systems biology by Bernard Paulson and colleagues. And now it's a very widespread um, approach and uh, it's often called flux balance analysis uh, as we'll see, we'll see in a second why. This is again a representation of metabolism for E. coli. There are nutrients and remember nutrients have to contain at least one source of carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and so on, all the elements that are needed to produce the different molecules. And then these molecules flow into uh, the proteins and the DNA and RNA and lipids uh, through the construction of the precursor, the monomers that are um, essential for, for building those molecules. And the cell, by putting these molecules in the right proportions, as we showed so before, produces what we call biomass, new cells, uh, that have, again, the right proportion of biomass components. There could be production of byproducts. And what we need to do now is try to find a way to simplify this process. So if I zoom in one of these reactions, this is glucose 6-phosphate, again, the beginning of the fermentation or glycolysis pathway I showed before with glucose coming in. And there is a very simple mass conservation, uh, which we impose by assuming that the system is at steady state. And this is the flux balance um, uh, approximation, uh, which is very, you know, very um, uh, helpful. Of course, one could argue whether or not this is reasonable. We can talk about this more later if uh, anybody's interested. But for now, imagine that you're keeping uh, a population of cells in a bioreactor in steady conditions, and you really, it seems reasonable to assume that overall, on average, between all the different cells, the uh, net amount of um, um, each metabolite overall in the population stays constant. There is no net accumulation or depletion of compounds. And this translates in the fact that now this um, sum of all the fluxes producing and consuming this molecule is now balanced to provide uh, zero. So this is the flux balance part. And now remember again, each of these fluxes would depend on the concentrations, but really this is where we abandon uh, the met uh, metabolite concentrations and really focus just on the fluxes. And if we just focus on the fluxes, if all we're interested in is knowing what are the rates of these reactions, then uh, we're really just dealing with this linear equation. And this is the world of flux balance analysis, is a world of fluxes where we forget about the metabolite, the internal metabolite concentrations, and we just try to understand the fluxes of these reactions. And of course, this makes this problem much simpler. Um, there is a constraint like this for each metabolite in the cell, but there is also uh, more constraints that you can add. In particular, there are constraints about the capacity of what is coming into the cell. And these are very important constraints because they define the specific conditions under which you're running a certain experiment. So for example, um, if a cell is grown, if a population of cells is growing a bioreactor with glucose available, and you know how much glucose you're putting into the bioreactor, the cells could not possibly take more glucose than you're providing. So this will give rise to an inequality in the flux of the glucose intake. Okay? Um, so again, this is a linear relationship, and you'll see in a second how all this, the linearity of the constraints for the fluxes uh, will make it possible for us to have a mathematically tra tractable problem. Uh, there are other constraints. For example, some reactions, all reactions, all metabolic reactions are supposedly reversible, but effectively, some reactions may be so um, uh, unbalanced thermodynamically that are effectively irreversible at uh, um, physiological concentrations. And if this is known, one can impose additional constraints on some reactions going only in one direction. So for example, this uh, flux for this irreversible reaction would be uh, said to be positive. Uh, and this is again, another constraints and another linear constraint on the fluxes. Uh, so all of these constraints together, the linear constraints um, for the conservation of mass at each node, at each metabolite, for each molecule coming inside the network, possible irreversibility constraint, they form, they define a space in the multidimensional space of fluxes, uh, which is called the feasible space. And as you can already see, this is a, um, a convex 
polyhedron. Why is this a convex polyhedron if this is not obvious? Well, because you have just hyperplanes, right? Uh, reaction uh, uh, constraints like this are hyperplanes of dimension n minus one in the n-dimensional space of fluxes. Uh, and of course, uh, it's difficult to represent this. So I am representing here a projection of this space on two dimensions, two arbitrary fluxes. So you have hyperplanes and you have one hyperplane for each constraint, for each metabolite that is conserved. This hyperplane will intersect each other and form a subspace uh, whose dimensionality depends on, on the whether or not these constraints are linearly dependent or not. And when you add this capacity constraints, you take half spaces and you end up having uh, these polyhedral uh, structures, um, convex polyhedra that represent the feasible spaces for the cell. Okay, so this is again a, a simple um, ideal uh, projection in two dimension of this space. So this is in itself interesting and there is a lot of work now on uh, just sampling this space. So if you know nothing more, but you have these constraints uh, for intracellular metabolism, you know what the uh, capacity constraints are related to the specific conditions under which you're running an experiment, you can already have this characterization of what the cell can and cannot do. And this is already quite intriguing and quite interesting. And again, if you think about this as uh, in contrast to uh, kinetic models where you you know, have differential equations, you solve the differential equations, you have a specific solution. This has a very different flavor here. We don't have a specific solution, but we have this uh, algebraic representation of a space of where the cells can be found. So it's an interesting geometrical object that allows, enables a lot of subsequent analysis. And one thing that um, has become kind of the standard approach in uh, uh, stoichiometric modeling is the idea of using optimization. Um, you can, you know, you might imagine why optimization might be helpful, but if you think of a cell as a system that has undergone long evolutionary um, selection towards, you know, for, for being efficient um, um, at producing its own biomass, growing efficiently, growing fast, um, you can imagine that uh, objective functions such as the maximization of the growth rate might be a reasonable hypothesis for what a cell might be trying to do. And the advantage of having an objective function is of course that now you can look within this space of possible fluxes, you can look for um, a flux that is optimal for a given objective function. And uh, for example, if you were to find, with, try and, uh, find within this feasible space, the point that maximizes Vj, this would be the point up here. Um, if, you are have, if you have in general, a general objective function represented by uh, hyperplane that you can imagine sliding uh, uh, along the space. And when this encountered an extreme of the space, this will be the optimum for the function. And you can, in this way, find the uh, maximum for this growth rate, uh, which will tell you among all the feasible points for the cell that balance all this consumption and production of molecules, you can find the point that allows the cell to grow uh, in an optimally efficient way. Okay. And this point, what is important about this specific point is that this is now a prediction that one can test experimentally. You'll have as an outcome, a vector of all the fluxes of the cell for every single uh, um, reaction, as well as a prediction of this growth rate. Uh, so you'll have a value for each of the fluxes, as well as the value for the growth rate, uh, which will tell you how fast, given all of these constraints, how fast do you expect a cell to be able to grow. Um, and by the way, uh, something that, again, we'll, we'll see more next time, but you can also predict whether a cell will produce byproducts. And those byproducts, if you were to uh, somehow embed this organism into an ecosystem with other organisms, that byproduct could now be the source of a cross-feeding interaction between multiple species, which is why um, you know, uh, one at some point uh, realized that this kind of models can be really helpful for modeling the ecology of microbes. Um, I want to point to some practical um, resources. If you have never seen this, uh, of course, I really enough information to get started right away. But I want to point to a couple of things that might be helpful. This is um, a paper from Jason Papin's lab that I think is a really nice um, overview and uh, 
practical way of getting started with doing these flux balance models. Uh, I think it has uh, some Python scripts that you can start using right away for doing uh, first simple models for simple networks and then going into increasingly complex networks. Um, there is um, a very nice uh, Python toolbox called Cobra Pi. Cobra stands for constraint, constraints based reconstruction and analysis. So this is uh, one of the names by which you'll find this flux balance models. Um, and Cobra Pi is an, a freely available resource for doing all sorts of things with flux balance modeling, uploading models, running um, optimizations and so on. And it's quite convenient. Uh, so I, uh, this would be a good starting point. I also put here uh, in a GitHub on our lab webpage, some basic scripts that I've been using for doing simple FBA and some models, uh, including the human cell model uh, that is um, that is now available. And there is, um, it's, it's a big world. So there are a lot of possibilities out there. Uh, there is a MATLAB toolbox. There are uh, different resources. Feel free to ask me later on if you need pointers to sp specific resources, but this should be a good uh, starting point. Now, um, okay, in the next few minutes, I wanna, um, point out some of the applications uh, of uh, flux balance modeling before going back to the ecological side. And you'll see actually that there is an uh, interesting connection between looking at what happens inside individual cells and scaling this up to the ecosystem level. Um, so one of the typical applications of flux balance modeling in the past has been to try and understand what happens if you delete a gene from a network. So imagine, um, uh, having E. coli, you can predict the uh, growth rate um, using flux balance modeling and ask what happens if you remove one gene, one reaction, say from uh, the organism, will the organism be able to survive? And one thing I realized now I forgot to mention is that the reason, one of the reasons this method is so valuable and efficient, some of you may be already aware of this, is that let me go back here for a second. Solving this problem is really uh, in itself a very efficient process. This can be done through a number of linear programming packages and algorithms, starting from the simplex algorithm to um, now more advanced uh, models that um, algorithm that use heuristics. But essentially in a fraction of a second, I think a hundredth of a second or so, you can have a solution to a single flux balance model. So imagine now, yes, there are caveats and there are uh, things to be careful about, the assumptions we made, the simplifying assumptions we made, but on the other hand, in a fraction of a second, you get a prediction of all the fluxes in the cell. And again, this is why this is, because it's so fast, uh, one can uh, use it to address questions such as doing all possible perturbations of the environment or the internal circuits of the cell to see how the cell responds. And we're going to go back here to this slide where the process of finding what is, how a cell responds to a perturbation can be viewed as a, a problem of reducing the space and finding again a point that is physiological relevant on the reduced space. Let me just give you an intuition for why that is the case. Um, when you have, so this green region represents again, the feasible space for the wild type unperturbed organism, where you can find its own objective function. If you remove, uh, and let's leave aside the fact that there may be a complex mapping between genes and reactions, but let's assume for now you just remove a reaction from the network. A reaction is made impossible because of the lack of a mutation into a given gene. So uh, that flux will suddenly only have the option of zero flux. There is no flux through that reaction anymore. So you have an additional constraint uh, in this multidimensional space. So we'll reduce this space to a subspace represented here in yellow. And now you can find within this subspace, what is, for example, again, the optimal, the maximal capacity for the cell to grow. And in this way, you can find, first of all, whether or not the cell can still grow after doing that perturbation and how fast, and you can compare and predict all the different uh, knockouts in uh, the genome of an organism relative to each other and relative to the wild type. And again, this uh, enables a lot of different downstream applications from metabolic engineering to evolutionary algorithm, start thinking about evolution, uh, of metabolic pathways and so on. 
Um, there is one thing that some of you may, may be asking yourselves, and which is um, a question we were interested in many years ago, which is whether really um, metabolism should be optimal also for knockouts. And you can think of, you know, first of all, this question of whether or not we know what the objective function is, is in itself an interesting open question, but it's particular tricky, particularly tricky when you think of a knockout organism. If you remove a gene from an organism that maybe did undergo long-term evolutionary optimization for being efficient at uh, growing, there is no reason for a perturbed organism to be efficient in its own subspace, right? So it's entirely possible that this perturbed organism will not be able to perform in its optimal way, uh, given that you just performed this perturbation. So uh, what is interesting is that you can look at alternative points in this space that may better represent what you expect um, a perturbed organism to do. And one possibility is to look at the projection of uh, this wild type point optimal on the original space onto the space of the knockout. Why uh, might this a good, a better prediction for the knockout? Um, if you think about this, what the, the implication of assuming that the uh, wild type organism is tending towards this optimum is that its internal regulatory pathways really allowed it to upregulate and downregulate the different genes to achieve this optimal production of the biomass components in a balanced way. Um, but once you remove a gene, the organisms still have that same regulatory circuit. So it's still try to go towards this optimum. And you can ask, what is the point that is as close as possible to this wild type optimum, but still constrained uh, onto the space of the knockout? And this would be the point that is at minimal distance um, on the yellow region of the knockout space um, that is as close as possible to the wild type within this yellow space. And you can solve this by minimizing this distance. Um, there is no obvious reason whether one should choose a Euclidean distance or an L1 norm or other distances. All of this has, has been, have been tried. Um, you can use quadratic programming for minimizing the Euclidean distance. And you can find um, this prediction of the knockout, which turns out to be, um, in many cases, a little bit more accurate than the prediction of the, uh, what the wild type or what the knockout optimal would do. And of course, one could imagine that throughout evolutionary processes, uh, a mutated organism could go from this suboptimal uh, initial point to the optimal point uh, in evolutionary steps. Um, let's see, I think I have a few more minutes. So um, this method is called minimization of metabolic adjustment and is one of many methods now that people use to probe uh, metabolic networks for uh, in, under different scenarios. One thing that I haven't told you, and I wanna give you a glimpse of whether and how one can test these models mm -hmm. and, and also the, you know, the caveats that one has to keep in mind in uh, making these models. And this is an example from a comparison I did many years ago based on uh, data from Uwe Sauer's lab at ETH. So this is um, E. coli grown in a thermostat in a bioreactor kept um, at constant uh, flow. And you see, uh, by the way, you can recognize here again, the path we saw before, glycolysis and the TCA cycle. And what was done here was to compare experimentally measured fluxes with uh, fluxes predicted with FPA. And first of all, I wanna mention that measuring fluxes experimentally is a very tricky and laborious process. Um, typically this is done with carbon-13 labeled uh, metabolites that go through the network and the carbon-13 atoms are, uh, dispersed through the network in different ways, and one can then figure out uh, the actual fluxes by um, uh, mapping where the carbon-13 went. And, and, but this is very complicated. And by the way, we know to do this, and not we, um, you know, experts in metabolic measuring can do this for individual organisms, but it's still an open challenge to try and measure fluxes uh, for communities and a very important one as we'll see later on. So, but what, what I wanna highlight here is that, um, there is a good agreement overall if you compare experimentally measured fluxes with predicted fluxes uh, for this E. coli grow under carbon limited conditions. So this is one mode of running this chemostat carbon limited, and there is very high agreement, um, which was 
testing for me when, when I first saw this. And now there's a lot of testing of different models. Some work better, some not as well. But this allows me to illustrate the fact that even the same organism under different conditions can have very different degrees of agreement with the flux balance prediction. So for example, if you take the same organism uh, and just uh, compare experimental fluxes with predicted fluxes under nitrogen limited conditions, you can see there's still some correlation, but there's clearly something that we don't understand here, or, or there is something that the model doesn't predict correctly. Um, and one could speculate of, on you know, why and what could be going uh, wrong here. Why is the model working under one condition and not the other? And you know, one possibility, for example, is that the assumption of maximal growth rate is reasonable for carbon limited E. coli, but not for nitrogen limited E. coli. Perhaps um, evolution adaptation and the regulatory circuits in E. coli are really compatible with his idea and hypothesis of maximal growth rate when uh, there is abundant carbon, uh, sorry, when, when carbon is a limiting resource, but not when nitrogen is limiting. And there may be other strategies that the cell may choose to uh, pursue. So this is one example. And just to illustrate again, that I, I view flux balance modeling as a hypothesis testing tool, as a way of asking interesting biological questions. Sometimes it can be used for valuable predictive modeling for metabolic engineering applications, but one has always to keep in mind that some of these assumptions we made may not be true under all conditions. Um, I think I have a few more minutes. Um, I will point just to other uh, papers that I think are representative of how people tested uh, these models. Um, there is a very nice work on showing how adaptive evolution can lead for, uh, from organisms that are initially suboptimal under certain condition to gradual optimization. There are other work showing that uh, this is, again, not always necessarily the case. This is from Bernard Paulson's lab. This is from Chris Marks and Will Harcom. Um, this is actually based on um, data from the Lensky uh, evolved E. coli lines. Very, very interesting uh, work. So uh, this is, um, you know, there, there is now a, a lot of work using these models and you'll see more and I bet you'll see um, exciting work from uh, Alvaro Sanchez's group that also has more of a, an evolutionary flavor. Um, I will last uh, conclude just by mentioning some of the um, good and bad aspects of flux balance. So I think I want to I wanna highlight again that there are some really uh, valuable and good reasons for using this uh, modeling approach for a number of applications, including, as we'll see, looking at ecological interactions. It's very fast. It's very scalable. You can easily look at larger organisms, multiple organisms together. And very importantly, you do not need the kinetic parameters, right? Once we made this transition from the world of metabolic um, concentrations, metabolic concentration to metabolic fluxes, we really forgot about um, the metabolic concentrations. And therefore, the steady states we compute do not really, we don't really need to know the kinetic parameters. Uh, it gets more complicated, as we'll see later when you want to go to communities, but we'll leave this for next time. But one thing I want to highlight, which again is, uh, is on the positive side here, is that um, you know, concentrations are obviously important, but there is something really unique about fluxes. And I think the cells care about the fluxes. We care about the fluxes. If you want to know how much is produced of a given compound, how much is consumed, this is going to be super important for ecological interactions. So it's somehow fortunate that these models through these simplifications are good at predicting fluxes because they were very, will be very helpful for embedding the single organism model into ecological models. But there are some limitations. And sometimes you really would like to know metabolite concentrations inside the cell because that's what is more easily measurable now with metabolomics approaches. Um, and because of the lack of metabolite concentrations intracellularly, you cannot really uh, explicitly model regulation um, because regulation, uh, in particular allosteric regulation where small molecules bind to the enzymes, for, for example, this is strongly dependent on the internal metabolic concentrations. And this is really beyond what flux balance models can do. There is very interesting work um, now uh, being explored, where if you incorporate some thermodynamic constraints in these networks, um, in, it's possible to put back concentration of metabolites. But I think that's where you know, the field needs a lot of creative energy for people trying to think how to go beyond you know, the kinetic paradigm and the flux balance 
to go be hybrid models that have the best parts of both. Um, there are other limitations. You cannot use in model fast dynamics because of this inherent uh, dynamic um, steady state approach. And the, what you predict is really population and time averages, not uh, single cell fluxes. Um, the other thing that is important to remember is that how accurate these models are will depend also on how well you know the boundary condition, for example, the uptake rates of different nutrients. Um, the, some of the challenges, some of the open directions, which again will be relevant for ecology as well. Um, you know, we, I showed you this snapshot of the biomass composition of a cell. Um, and this is often treated as a fixed vector of numbers, but in real life, this is a condition dependent composition, right? E. coli and all living cells will change their biomass composition as a function of the environment. There are striking examples of marine bacteria that instead of phospholipid, use sulfolipids when they're under phosphorus limited conditions. So this is really important and we barely know, uh, you know how the biomass composition of cells change. So this is very interesting. Uh, we know very little about the maintenance, how much energy is spent uh, by metabolism in uh, doing non-metabolic um, processes. Oops, sorry. Um, and uh, there is um, interest again, in, uh, as I was saying, in mapping the global effects of thermodynamics on these networks. Um, and, but this is an, an ongoing challenge, partially because we don't know the chemical potential of a lot of these molecules. And the last and not least important uh, challenge is that, as I said, we know quite well the models for some organisms, even you know, despite the limitations. But when you start thinking about extending these approaches to modeling a whole gut microbiome with thousands of different species or the ecology of microbes in soil, this becomes a much bigger challenge. And, and what a lot of people struggle with uh, is how to efficiently build models for all these different species and scale up these modeling approaches to really start looking at interaction between species in complex communities. And this is where we'll start from next time. Um, so I will pause here and uh, I think we have time for questions. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, yeah, I think I, we have a raised hand from Ashish, you know, George, you, you can ask the question. Uh, hi. Uh, hey, Daniel. Uh, that was a very interesting talk. Uh, I had a, a question actually about the first part um, in terms of like this kind of acetate uh, cross-feeding in E. coli or like the respiration fermentation kind of thing. Um, what's so special about, I guess, uh, acetate or I guess uh, starting stopping in this point just before the TCA cycle? Like why not cross feed somewhere else? Why not in between the TCA cycle or a little further above? Um, is there something special about this point that E. coli likes or like you know, cells like to? So that's, a, that's an excellent question. And I think, um, I think this, is, uh, this is still a highly debated and, and hot area of research. Um, I'll give you an idea, for example, one of the, and, and you know, there, there is a, one of the classical examples, which is true both for yeast metabolism and for cancer metabolism, is that we really don't know why certain cells, despite having the possibility of doing the TCA cycle and despite having oxygen around, choose to ferment. So uh, for, um, for yeast, for example, one of the hypotheses is that in a competition for survival with other organisms, it may actually be beneficial to stop here secrete ethanol. As you know, ethanol is a good uh, disinfectant, right? So it can kill bacteria around. So it might be a good strategy for yeast to first secrete the ethanol, kill a uh, competing organism. And in fact, um, yeast is capable of taking up the ethanol again, doing the respiration of ethanol after um, consuming all the glucose. So this is called a dioxic shift. And, and so there is a lot of complexity in, in these uh, processes where cells may decide to do first the first half of the pathway and then retake up uh, the, the compound that was secreted and use it uh, through the complete 
Okay, so like, uh, uh, like uh, respiration. So like acetate and glycerol or something would also be could have inhibitory effects. Like, I guess like E. coli shows like excretes acetate or glycerol or something, right? Yeah. So let me tell you something else that happens. So again, this can vary very much from system to system, and and you know people have come up with different reasons for why organisms sometimes ferment even if they could. Uh, respire. But in this, let's say in the case of acetate for E. coli, for example, what might happen is that E. coli might be actually oxygen limited. And if you're oxygen limited, right, you cannot run this pathway um, or you can run it only partially. So it is possible in principle that when you're limited by oxygen, um, you know, you have no option but to run this pathway to keep going and then you produce acetate. And if oxygen becomes available, you could in principle respire. Um, but in other cases, such as the lactate production for cancer cells is really highly debated. And there are many different reasons for, you know, people believe this might be happening. One of which has to do with um, efficiency. And again, this trade-off between rating and yield. I think this paper I was mentioning by um, Pfeiffer, Schuster and Borhofer has uh, some really interesting hypothesis about the fact that really maybe there are some deep thermodynamic reasons um, and there are some old papers proposing this, that, that fermentation might be in, indeed inherently faster than respiration. So really there is a trade-off between rate and yield. And you can imagine that if there is a population, you know, the, the fast but inefficient will take over uh, typically, and that's what uh, cancer cells might do. Whereas in the slow but inefficient, uh, the slow and inefficient, sorry, the slow but efficient organisms uh, or cells, would be able to survive in the competition with the fast and inefficient if there is spatial structure. So this is one of the uh, hypotheses of this paper. And, uh, and it's potentially a hypothesis that could explain, for example, the competition between planktonic cells, cancer cells, uh, versus the structure of the body uh, that is uh, if, you know, based on this efficient, well-organized metabolism, but also about um, the rise of multicellular organisms. And this all seems to match in the sense that, you know, when oxygen becomes available, you can do this more efficient metabolism. There is a, a more, uh, you know, cells are more thoughtful about using resources um, efficiently, enabling uh, the, the, the rise of complex multicellular systems. So I don't know if this addressed completely your question, but the, the, the complete landscape can be very complicated. And, mm -hmm. and some of this has to do with, you know, deeper biochemistry reasons, which we cannot go into now and, you know, I'd be happy to talk about. Thank you. That was good. Okay, we have uh, a question from Martina Darbello. Hi. Um, um, thank you for your talk. And so, could you come back to the slide that we were talking about, about the usable byproducts? Oh, this one? Uh, yeah, so my question is, it, so here it seems that uh, uh, cells, uh, let's say, release in the environment uh, uh, usable by, uh, byproducts that can be used by other cells only if they are ferment. But isn't it a bit of a huge assumption? Thank you. Yes. So this is definitely not the case. So this is one way in which cells could secrete something that is usable by other cells, but by, it's by no means the only option. Um, I think this is observed often, but there may be many, many, many different ways in which cells secrete by products that are used by other organisms. Um, and we'll see this extensively next time. But uh, there is a lot of I mean, there are, if you measure the molecules that are spilled out of a cell, uh, they can be very different and complex. There is also a whole really interesting, and again, fairly open question of how much of this cross-feeding happens through byproducts that are secreted by live cells, as opposed to cells dying and spilling out everything they have inside. So in that case, everything that a cell has inside becomes usable by product for other cells with huge ecological implications, definitely in the ocean uh, cycling and so on. So um, again, I think you point to a very interesting question. You know, in some, some cases we know, but in most cases, we really are just starting to scratch the surface of mapping this usable by products. Okay, uh, thank you. <laughs>
We have one more question from Monday, Sunday, Adirha. Yeah, please. Um, so, um, you talked about limited uh, oxygen in the in in the two pathway of uh, the fermentation and the respiration. But I'm 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 looking at something. If the uh, there's a limit in oxygen, uh, would this pathway still exist, or there can be a reverse or a distortion? Okay, great question. So. Um, the pathway itself, right, if an organism has this pathway, this pathway is there, meaning that the proteins um, for making this reaction happen, they are in the genome, they are staying there, and of course the organism in absence of oxygen could decide not to express those proteins, proteins that may not be expressed, although as you remember from this slide, right, there are other reasons for uh, running the TCA cycle. In fact, the cycle itself can run even in absence of oxygen. What needs oxygen is some of the downstream processes, but in order to produce these byproducts, the cell may need to run some of all of the reaction in this cycle. Um, but it's also true, and I think this is what you're hinting to, that these pathways can also run in reverse. And the diversity of metabolic pathways across microbes is out, you know, incredible. And some organisms will have some portions of this cycle, some organisms uh, you know, and for example, if you feed an organism ethanol or acetate, they will not have the glucose that is necessary for building other molecules, so they will run this pathway backwards. So I think different organisms will have different options, and they could, depending again on whether, you know, that there is a, the two aspects of this. One is what capabilities they have in their genome, uh, and some may or may not have all of these capabilities, but even if they have the capabilities, based on the presence and absence of oxygen and through sensing and signaling and so on, the organism may decide and figure out which enzyme to express. Does this answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm okay. Yeah. I don't see any more questions. Uh, so maybe it's time to take a short break before we start with our new lecture. Um, thanks, thanks again, Daniel, and see you soon. Thank you. Bye. And we'll uh, make a, a five minutes break, more or less, and reconvene again at uh, quarter past six uh, CET time.